Well, good morning, everyone. It's so great to see you. Great to be with you, to worship our God together. I hope that you had a, a wonderful weekend so far. And uh, we had a, a great time on Friday uh, watching the movie Cessationist. And it was very instructive, very helpful. And uh, I've heard many positive feedback. Uh, and so, <clears throat> if you would like to watch that movie, you can actually download it online on Netflix or uh, another medium and then watch it at home, I think would be helpful to you. Well, this morning we want to continue and to conclude the topic we began to study last week, and that is the will of God. And so this is part two of a two-part message titled, What is the Will of God? And I do hope that you had the opportunity this past week to listen to the message again or to watch it on YouTube. I think that would have been helpful to you to refresh your mind. But either way, I think it will be beneficial if we hit some of the high points from last week uh, before we move on to consider uh, scriptural support for what has been said, and as well as give you some reasons why this topic ought to be important to us as people who have a very high view of Scripture. And so I want to give you a summary. We have a lot of ground to cover this morning, and so it's a good thing we've gained an hour, because that means I get to preach two hours this morning, and that'll be almost enough time. I'm just kidding, okay? Some people started sweating. Let's begin with a brief summary. Uh, first, I made the point last week that words have a range of meaning. Uh, words have more than one meaning. And in the case of words that deal with the will of God, I want to remind you this morning of the range of meaning that we see in Scripture. These are words that we find in the Bible that pertain to God's will. And so if you want to write them down, if you haven't already, this is the range of meaning with words that deal with God's will. Obviously, God's will. That's obvious. But also, the Bible speaks of God's plan, God's purpose, His counsel, His desire, His intention, His decision, His decree, which means His order or command, His wish, His choice, His determination, and His pleasure. What is pleasing to God, what is not pleasing to God. Some things God takes pleasure in, other things grieve God. And so all of those uh, deal with God's will, and you will have noticed that you will find at least one of these words in all of the verses I referenced last week in the first sermon. But the question is this, if a word can have more than one meaning, how do we determine the meaning of the word in the passage in which it is being used? How do we determine how the author is using the word? And the answer to the question is context. The context of the paragraph in which the word is found, the context of the book in which the word is found, we want to know how the author uses the word in his argument, and then the context of the entire Bible. Because a word is not going to render a meaning to a verse that's going to teach something that contradicts what the Bible teaches somewhere else. The Bible has one author, God, and God doesn't contradict himself. God doesn't make mistakes. And, and so that's the first reminder. Second, I stressed, and this is very important, and I'm going to attempt to remind you of this throughout the sermon today. God has one perfect will. God has one will. Not two wills, not three wills. He has one perfect will. But as we saw last week, to us as finite human beings, His one will is seen as having different aspects. There are different aspects to His will. And I talked about four different aspects last week. Well, let's review those briefly. First, we saw God's decretive will. God's will of decree. And, and this will is in reference to what God has planned in eternity past and which He brings to pass sovereignly without fail. What God has willed will happen. 
That is God's decretive will. And he brings it to pass, this is important, either by actively bringing it to pass or by allowing it to come to pass. As we saw last week, God's decretive will is also known as God's sovereign efficacious will and as God's secret will. Here's a point I want to add that I did not mention last week. Very important. God fulfills His decretive will even through the free actions of men. God fulfills His decretive will even through the free actions of people. That, that's God's decretive will. The second aspect of His will is God's preceptive will. God's will of precept. It's also known as God's revealed will. It is the will that God has revealed in His precepts, in His laws, His commandments, His instructions, in the Word of God, which He desires us to obey. And the key with God's preceptive will is that it can be left unfulfilled. Man can sin. Man can disobey God's preceptive will. Man disobeys and breaks the law. Although, I remind you again, that even God's will of precept is a part of one, one will in God. His will of decree. Third, we have God's permissive will. God's permissive will. You hear the word permission there. And that simply speaks to the fact that God permits people to sin. God allows people to break His preceptive will. And He doesn't allow people to sin in the sense that He is not sovereign and not able to do something about it to, to stop them from sinning. He is actively allowing them to sin. God's permissive will. Finally, we saw God's will of disposition. God's will of disposition simply speaks to what God takes pleasure in and what God does not take pleasure in. And so I, I hope that is a, a good review, a, a good summary for you to keep in mind. But last week I told you that I would show you today how all of these aspects work together in the Scriptures. And so we want to move on to that now. We ended the first message last Sunday with a weighty statement. A sobering statement which I believe the Scriptures fully support and which I hope to prove to you this morning. We were on the topic of salvation. And I made the point that God is able to save all people. God has the power to save all people. But that that is not the question. It's not a question about God's ability or potential to save. The biblical question we must ask is this, has God decreed the salvation of all people? Has God chosen to save all people? And the biblical answer to that question is no. And Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 was given in support of that, that He has chosen His people in Christ before the foundation of the world. But, even without Scripture, or other Scripture rather, we know that's not the case. Why? Because if God had decreed the salvation of all people, there would be no people in hell. And we know that's not the case. There is a hell, and people go there. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 7, few be there that enter eternal life. Because the, the gate is narrow, and so is the way. And so, the point was made then that God also wills to exalt His great name, to magnify His glory, even in the death of the wicked. Even in the death of people. That is a sobering thought. But the question we have to ask, is it biblical? Is it biblical? So let's get into that now. 
Let's look at some examples in Scripture of how all of these aspects work together. Always remembering, in the mind of God, it's one will. And so the third heading I want to give you, I gave you two headings last week. Here's the third heading, scriptural support. Okay, Scriptural support or biblical support, whichever you'd like to write. And I'm going to give you four examples under this heading. And the first one is Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Now last week, we, we saw that God desired to put the sons of Eli to death. That's what it says in 1 Samuel 2.25. But that's not the best example. The most powerful example of this concept of God magnifying His name in the death of people is that of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Now, in, in the book of Exodus, what do we see? We see that Yahweh, God, has decreed the destruction of Pharaoh and his army for what purpose? In order to exalt his name, in order to put his glory on display. That's what I want to show you this morning. So, we know the account of Exodus, right? Uh, Israel is enslaved in Egypt. And God raises up a man by the name of Moses, and he sends him to Egypt, and he tells Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. That is God's revealed will, a command to Pharaoh, which God wants Pharaoh to obey. But we know Pharaoh disobeys that commandment. And so what does God do? He judges Egypt with plagues, and then eventually... Pharaoh agrees to let the people of God go. And once Israel is gone out of Egypt, we read that Pharaoh changes his mind and he pursues Israel with his army. He overtakes them at the Red Sea, and we all know how that ends. God drowns Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. So let's get into this keeping the aspects of God's will in mind. God sends Moses, and he commands Pharaoh to let the people go. That's God's preceptive will. It's a revealed command to Pharaoh. Let my people go. Does Pharaoh obey the command? No. Pharaoh does not let the people go. Did God permit Pharaoh to disobey the command. Yes. How do we know that? Because he disobeyed the command. Was God pleased that Pharaoh disobeyed the command? No. God takes no pleasure in disobedience or sin. And so then we ask the question, why did Pharaoh disobey the command of God to let the people go? And you could say, well, he wanted to. He chose to sin. Sure, amen. But the Bible gives us another answer. God tells us why, and He tells us why in Exodus 14, verse 4. Exodus 14, verse 4. Where it says, that I will, Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Why did Pharaoh disobey? I will harden his heart, God says. And he will not let the people go. And what's the purpose for God hardening the heart of Pharaoh? He tells us right here, I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's the reason. That's the reason. And so how is God to be honored through Pharaoh and his army? By their death. By all their deaths. How would the Egyptians know I am the Lord? By their death. By their destruction. That's exactly what this verse is teaching. 
Now, I want you to think about this. I want to be somewhat repetitive with this first example so that we understand what's going on. God commands Pharaoh to let the people go. Did God desire Pharaoh to obey the command? Yes, he desires obedience in that sense, in the preceptive sense. Otherwise, he would not command it. Did God permit Pharaoh to disobey? Yes, but only for a time. Was God pleased that Pharaoh disobeyed? No, God takes no pleasure in sin or disobedience. And yet, the question is this. Did God decree that Pharaoh would repent and obey God? No. God's plan of decree was that Pharaoh would be born that Pharaoh would come to power, that Pharaoh would disobey God's command, and that Pharaoh would be destroyed. Why? In order to magnify the glory of God above the greatest earthly power. And you say, really? That's what the Scriptures tell us. Let me show you. Exodus 7, 2-5. Exodus 7, verses 2-5. to In verse 2, we read, this is God speaking to Moses. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh. What's he going to tell Pharaoh? The command? That he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. That is God's revealed will, His preceptive will. Let my people go. But then God says in verse 3, Oh, by the way, Moses, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my host, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments." The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So what we see here is that God commands Pharaoh, let my people go, preceptive will, while at the same time, God prevents Pharaoh from obeying the command. I will harden his heart. He will not listen. For what purpose? They will know I am the Lord. God's preceptive will, let my people go. God's permissive will, Pharaoh disobeys. God's will of disposition, not happy about the disobedience. God's will of decree, the destruction of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Why? So that his name would be glorified. Objection, number one. That's not fair. How could God do that to people? Pharaoh and the Egyptians were people. They deserved an opportunity to to be Yahweh's people and to live. Let me respond to that. Nothing could have been fairer than what God did to Pharaoh. Pharaoh. You know what's not fair? If anything's not fair, you want, you want to know what's not fair? That God is gracious, loving, and forgiving. That's not fair. It's not fair to God. Because fair for us is that everyone receives the same judgment Pharaoh received. Everyone dies. Everyone goes to hell. That's fair. That's, that's biblically fair. Pharaoh got what he deserved. The Egyptians got fair. Could God have decreed Pharaoh to receive mercy instead of judgment? He could have, yes, but he didn't. He decreed Pharaoh to receive judgment. And so as R.C. Sproul put it once, we don't want fair. We want mercy. We don't want fair. We want mercy. And God has mercy on the the one whom He wills to have mercy. 
And if this interpretation sounds new or strange to you, that, that God decrees the destruction of people for a certain purpose to magnify His name, it shouldn't sound odd at all. Because this is exactly how Paul interpreted the life of Pharaoh in Romans 9. In the flesh, humanly speaking, what are we tempted to say? That God is unjust. That there's no justice with God for withholding salvation from people. And Paul, he anticipated that accusation against God. And this is why he says what he says in Romans 9, 14 to 18. Listen to this. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, not on man's will, but on God who has mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh. Notice what Paul is doing here. He's using the term Scripture synonymously with God. The Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up. Why? Because when the Bible speaks, God speaks. For this purpose, I have raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So not just Egypt, but if you read the Old Testament, all the nations knew what God had done to Egypt. And they were afraid of Israel because of their God. So then, He has mercy on whom He desires. He hardens whom He desires. Who has control? God. God. Second objection. That's not loving. That's evil of God. That's unloving for Him to do that. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. When God pours out justice on sinners, it is nothing but good, loving, and right. It is nothing but loving. Are we upset when, uh, when an earthly judge gives a murderer life in prison without parole? Does that anger us? No, we say, that's loving. That's good. It's loving to the victim's family. It's loving to society. To take that person out of that. Out of society. Put them in prison. That's good. That's loving. And so why do people find fault with God when He does the same thing? With criminals. It all goes back to this. Pe people think they are inherently good. That they deserve heaven. That they deserve grace. That they deserve God's goodness. But it's really simple math. Okay, It's very simple. 1 John 3.4 says, Sin is lawlessness. What is lawlessness? It is the breaking of law. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Translation, all are criminals. The first half of Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. All people have sinned. All people deserve death. That's what we deserve. That's what people deserve. And so whenever God deals with criminals as criminals, He's simply doing the right thing. He's simply doing the right thing. Whenever a person is judged, that person receives fair. That should not amaze us. What should amaze us is that anyone should be saved. That's amazing. What should amaze us is that God does extend grace, mercy, compassion to guilty sinners, to all who repent of their sins and turn to His Son, Jesus Christ, in faith. By faith alone in Jesus, you're saved. If you believe that He lived the perfect life that you couldn't live, He's the only one that's never sinned. 
he kept the law of God perfectly because he's God. If you believe, he went to the cross and on the cross he bore your sins and that he was punished for your sins. And if you believe he rose again on the third day, you're saved. You're forgiven. And you say, well, I thought God was just. I, I thought he had to punish sin. He has punished sin. He punishes it on the cross. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. You see, that he forgives people doesn't mean that he just lets people into heaven without punishing their sins. The cross was necessary for God to fulfill his justice. And once sin is taken out of the way at the cross, God is now able to extend mercy. What should be a which we should be upset about is not that the thief died on the cross. He deserved it. What we should be upset about is that the Son of God on the cross right next to Him should die. He never deserved it. That, that's what we should be upset about. That Jesus died. He's the only person that never deserved death. Everyone else simply gets what they deserved. If anything's unfair, it's the cross. If anything's unfair, let's say it's, it's the death of Christ. It's unfair to Him. But God did it for us. He did it for us. And so we see in Pharaoh, God receives glory. He vindicates His holiness his righteousness in the death of the wicked. The point is this. I know this is the longest example. Don't panic. All four examples are not this long. The point is this. God fulfills His decretive will, His sovereign will, through the means of disobedience to His preceptive will, which He allows to happen, but which He's not happy about when it happens. Second example, Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11. In, in the book of Joshua, Joshua is leading the nation of Israel to conquer the promised land. And we read in Joshua that all the kings of the land, except for the, the Hivites of, Gideon, of, uh, of Gibeon, made war against Joshua and Israel instead of making peace. And so all the kings of the land, they went to war against Israel instead of making peace with them. The question is why? You could say, well, they wanted to make war against Israel. They wanted to fight Israel. It was their decision to do that. Right? We say, yes, amen. The Scriptures give us a different answer. Joshua 11.20 Joshua 11.20 why did the kings go to war against Israel? Joshua 11.20 For, that is, because it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to meet Israel in battle in order that for this purpose He might destroy them utterly that they might not receive mercy but that He might destroy them just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Why did they go to war against Israel? Because the Lord hardened their hearts that they might be destroyed. Do we see that? A third example. This is for a different purpose. This is more on the positive side. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph and his brothers. In the book of Genesis. In Genesis, we read, Joseph is thrown into a ditch by his brothers. They were going to kill him, but they want to make some money instead. And so they, they sell him to some Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt. And, uh, and so they sell their brother off. And we notice some things here. Joseph's brothers hated Joseph. They had murder in the heart. They wanted to kill him. They threw him in a ditch. They sold him into slavery. 
And then they lied to Jacob about what happened to Joseph. So let me ask you the simple question. This, did Joseph's brothers disobey God's preceptive will, his commands? Yes. Yes, they lied. They had murder, hatred in the heart. They sold their brother off to slavery. Did God allow it to happen? Yeah, because it happened, right? Was God pleased that it happened? No. God takes no pleasure in sin. Now, with that, with that in mind, we move on to the end of the account. We know Joseph is in Egypt. He rises to power, second only to Pharaoh, because God was with him. There's a famine in the land, and Joseph has all the food. And, and we have the brothers. Uh, they're sent by the father Jacob to go get food in Egypt. And they come to realize, oh, Joseph's alive. He's second in command only to Pharaoh. And what happens to them? They become afraid. Joseph is going to take revenge. He's going to have us put to death. Does Joseph do that? No. Why? Because Joseph understood something. This was God's plan all along. We see this in his words, Genesis 50, verse 20. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers. Listen to what he says. As for you, brothers of mine, you meant evil against me. That's what they meant. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Do we see that? Let's keep that up on the screen. As for you, to the brothers, you meant evil against me. You sinned. You broke God's precepts. You sinned against me. You meant it for evil. God allowed it to happen because it happened. Was he pleased? No, it's labeled here as evil. But God meant it for good. God's decretive will, God's eternal plan was for Joseph to go through all of that. Why? Salvation. Salvation in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Had, had Joseph not gone through any of that, he doesn't rise to power. He doesn't have the food in the famine. Israel perishes. Israel perishes. Judah perishes. Judah perishes, no David, no David, no Messiah, no Messiah, no you or me. God's decretive plan. They're going against His preceptive will. He's saying, do this, they go against it, they break it. And in so doing, they fulfill His decretive will. God's will happens, His decreed of will, often by means of things He does not want to happen or the violation of His precepts, which He allows to happen though He's not pleased by it. So Joseph understood all that he went through, his, his life, his experiences had a greater purpose. And it's the same for us. All that you experienced in life, all your suffering, your pain, all your challenges, it's not an accident. God's in control. And maybe you don't know why all that has happened, like Joseph, until the end. When you look back and you realize this is what God was doing this whole time. This is what this suffering and this pain has brought about. The ways of God are beyond understanding. Truly, He does work all things together for the good of those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purposes, foreknown, predestined. God has a plan. He's in control. 
The final example, the most important example, the execution of Jesus Christ. The execution of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you some questions. Who betrayed Jesus? Judas. Was it sinful? Who questioned Jesus and labeled him a blasphemer? The Pharisees. Was that sinful? Who scourged Jesus and crucified Jesus? Romans. Was it sinful? Did God allow it to happen? Was he happy about it? Yeah, what does Scripture tell us about all that Jesus endured? It was always God's plan. It was plan A. <laughs> it wasn't plan B or C or D. God doesn't need those. It was plan A. It was all according to God's decretive will. Where do we see that? Acts 2.22-23. to 23. Acts 2, 22 to 23, day of Pentecost, Peter is preaching, the audience, all those in, in uh, Jerusalem, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Verse 23, this man, Jesus, delivered over by, what's the cause? The predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, will of decree. You have nailed to the cross violation of preceptive will. You have freely sinned against them. They chose to do that. You knelt to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You see that? How did God accomplish his eternal purpose and decree? Through the disobedience of his preceptive will, which he allowed to happen even though he's not happy about it. Acts 4, 27 to 28. Acts 4, 27 to 28. The saints say, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, they're speaking to God in prayer, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do what? To do free actions of men, whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Did they sin? Yes. They sinned. They chose to sin. And yet, it was always in God's plan to work that into a plan of redemption. These men fulfilled God's decretive will, put the Son to death in order to save sinners. By means of disobedience to His preceptive will, they sinned against Jesus, which God allowed to happen, permissive will, though God was not pleased that it happened. And it's a mind-blowing idea that God used sin in His plan to rescue from sin. That sin was necessary to forgive sinners. To crucify Christ. To murder Him. For a good purpose. God uses even sin and sinners to accomplish an ultimate good. Did God sin? No. Did the sin originate in God? No. He allowed it to come to pass. I wish I could keep giving you examples, but those four, I think, suffice. Let me give you, finally, just some reasons why this subject is so important for us to understand. Fourth heading, 
the fourth heading is simply this. Why does this topic matter? Why does understanding God's will matter? Number one, it matters because God's word matters. It matters because the Bible matters. And we ought to care about what God has revealed. We should not be content with a, a, a view of God's will that it is a flat concept because the Bible tells us it's multidimensional. We shouldn't be content with simplistic concepts of God because to know our God is to know all that God has revealed about Himself and how He has revealed it. And we want to know Him more. We want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. All of who He is. And this is one of His key and most complex and difficult attributes. His will. And I want to say something before we move on. I mentioned it in my class. I know this may be going up against an emotional response. It doesn't, it doesn't sit well, many of the things I'm saying, with us emotionally, in the flesh. But let me encourage you, the question is this, is this what the Bible is teaching? Is it the truth? And at that point, my emotions don't matter anymore. At that point, the question is, am I going to accept this as what it is and what it says, or am I going to reject it because I don't think it's right? I don't feel it's right. That's, that's the song we sang this morning said, we do not walk by sight or feeling, we walk by faith. It's about what you believe. Second reason this is important. It helps us to understand and to interpret certain passages, specifically with salvation of men and women. This is often where the will of God comes into play the most heavy. And so I want to give you one example of a text I believe is often misunderstood, perhaps because of a lack of understanding of God's will. And that is 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9 where Peter says, the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, if we could keep that up, please. How do most people interpret this verse? They read into the word any, every single individual whatsoever. God wishes every individual who ever exists not to perish. That's His wish. But as we have seen just now, we have to, we have to ask. He certainly did desire to put the sons of Eli to death. He certainly wished to put Pharaoh to death. He certainly wished to kill the Egyptians. And so that, that should make us question a little bit. Okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? The first question we have to ask always when we read the Bible, what is the context? What's the context here? And the key is this. What does the word any point to? Any who? Or any what? People automatically read into the word any individual whatsoever. But I believe the context is clear that Paul, that, excuse me, Peter is talking here about specifically the elect. And I want to show you why I believe that. In the same verse, what does he say right before not wishing for any to perish? That he is patient toward you. We have to ask the question well, who's the you? Who is Peter writing to? The elect. He goes, he says this in 2 Peter 1.10. In 2 Peter 1.10, he identifies the audience as the elect. The chosen people of God before the foundation of the world. That's consistent with Scripture, right? Now, what Peter is saying here, 
as I, as I see it in the context, is this. He is not wishing or willing for any of you to perish, any of the elect to perish. In God's permissive will, He allows evil and sin to exist for a time. Why? So that the elect might have the opportunity to hear the gospel, to repent and believe, and to be saved because He's not willing for any of His people to perish. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And I lose none of them. But, for the sake of argument and example, let's suppose what Peter's saying is any individual whatsoever, he does not wish to perish. Even, even, in, even in that interpretation, okay? With our understanding of the aspects of God's will, we have to ask this question. In what sense is God not willing that any would perish? Okay? Is it in the decretive sense? God would be saying, I command you not to perish. And if, if that were the case, no one would perish. And that's called universalism. Everyone goes to heaven. Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. God is so loving, he would never send anyone to hell. That's a heresy. Okay? Or is it in the preceptive will, God would be saying, I do not allow you to perish. That doesn't fit the context, right? And that included in that is the permissive will. Or is it in the sense of a will of disposition? He doesn't take pleasure in that anyone should perish, but that they would turn. That could fit the context, right? That could fit the context that God does not take pleasure and that any should perish, but that His desire would be that people obey, call to repent and believe the gospel. And in fact, I believe that's the sense in Ezekiel 33.11. Ezekiel 33.11, you can study that in your own time. It all goes back to this. What's the question we have to ask? Has He decreed? the salvation of all people. No. Right? Ephesians 1.4 Who believes the gospel? Acts 13.48 Those appointed to eternal life believed. Who repents from sin? 2 Timothy 2.25 Those to whom the Lord grants repentance. Gives repentance. And now we can understand why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.10, it makes sense of this. 2 Timothy 2.10, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. The elect, same word, same context. So that they, who? Who is the they? The chosen also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Do we see that? Other, 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 I mean, in, in a different sense, Paul would be saying, why wouldn't he say, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of all people, indiscriminately? Because of election. Romans 11.7 Romans 11.7 tells us the chosen, the elect, obtain salvation. The rest, like Pharaoh, are hardened and will not believe. Romans 11.7 What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it. And the rest were hardened. Why did the Jews not believe Jesus? John 12, 39 to 40. John 12, 39 to 40. Why did the Jews not believe Jesus? Well, they decided not to believe. Well, you could say that. This is what this verse says. For this reason, here's why they could not believe. Impossibility. 
For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. You see that? For this reason they could not believe. So in one sense, Jesus is commanding something, while in another sense, God is preventing that commandment from coming about. We see this not just in these examples, but all over the New Testament. Matthew 11, Come to me, all you. John, none can come to me unless... You see that? I wish I could... Just keep giving you cross-references. I think this makes the point. God has decreed the cross, and He has decreed all those who would believe in the one who hung upon the cross. And so, saint, you're a Christian because God has decreed you to be a Christian. You were always going to be a Christian without fail. And when Jesus hung on the cross, He had your face in mind. Specifically. Very quickly, two brief reasons. Three, this truth produces humility. It's the great pride crusher. And fear of God, reverent fear. It's humbling to think God didn't have to choose me. He had no reason to choose me. And yet He raised me up with Christ, adopted me into His family. That will humble you and cause you to have reverent fear and promote holiness in your life. And then finally, the fourth and final reason to understand God's will for you. What is God's will for you? What's God's will for me? It's not that you live with your eyes in the sky 24-7 and watching 24-7 prophetic videos on YouTube. End time prophecy. It's, It's not for you to try to discern God's secret hidden will. That's that's his business. It's simply for you to live a life of holiness modeled after the Son. It's for you to live out your salvation and humble gratitude for God's redemptive grace. How? By studying God's revealed will. By studying the Scriptures and learning the Scriptures, and memorizing the Scriptures, and then obeying the Scriptures in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is to proclaim His Gospel to all nations and make disciples. Tell all people about Christ. And then worry. let God worry about the results. That's the will of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We understand that this is heavy truth. And I think that for many, it will take time to study these passages, to study what has been said. And I pray that You would give discernment and understanding. I ask, Lord, that You would use this and even in the conviction of someone who is in sin to turn to You in repentance and faith. Because at the same time, Your Word tells us that all who come to You, You will receive. You will no wise cast out. Anyone who is willing and desiring to be saved will be saved if they go to Christ. So I ask, if there be anyone here who's lost, that this would be the time they turn to Jesus and embrace Him by faith and receive eternal life. It's in His name we pray and ask. Amen.